Okay, so this is going to be our second lecture on the Roman Empire. Uh, so if you haven't watched the first lecture, you should go back and watch it because I'm not going to review everything. We'll kind of skip through really quick what we talked about last time. So I gave a little overview of kind of the general history of um, the Roman Empire and, and how that uh, government structure changes over time. And then we looked at uh, the work of the Roman Republic. We're going to look at some more things from the Republic and the early empire today. So we were looking at uh, temple structures. We were looking at some of the Roman innovations in architecture and structural engineering, specifically related to the development of concrete. Um, we talked about other trends in artwork and sculpture. We talked about Pompeii. And we left off talking about um, the Roman house and a typical Roman house and the different kinds of um, rooms and things within a dolmus, which is a uh, Roman house. So in this lecture, I really want to focus on painting. So we're going to talk about the four styles of Roman painting. Um, this is also sometimes called the uh, Pompeian style paintings because a lot of what we know about these styles of painting are from Pompeii and Herculaneum and the surrounding area because as I talked about last time when Vesuvius, the volcano, erupted, it's sort of near Napoli, near Naples and, and everything in that area, um, a lot of these cities were destroyed but they were also preserved in, in the lava and ash. So we have really nice pristine um, preserved frescoes uh, in these different styles of painting. So it, it's, it's something that makes it uh, fairly easy to study. So um, basically, uh, there's a um, archaeologist who, kind of archaeologist come art historian, who uh, determines these styles, who sort of delineates what these four styles of Roman painting will be. His name is August Ma, and he's German. Uh, he lives from 1840 to 1909, 10, somewhere in there. And he, um, so before him, when people were unearthing things in Pompeii, their tendency was they wanted to just cut out these little pieces of fresco and take them off to museums and study them. And our buddy August is like, what if we looked at these holistically within the fresco as a whole and could determine something about changing trends and tendencies in the way painting styles were developed in the Roman Empire? And people are like, that's not a bad idea. Context is good. So he kind of changes the way these, these works are studied. And he divides them into these four Pompeian or Roman styles very kindly. He doesn't give them complicated names. So from your standpoint as a student, it makes it easier to remember, right? Um, speaking specifically to those of you who are watching this in my art history class, random internet people, you don't have to remember this, but it's, it's easy to remember and know if you go to like a pub trivia or something. The four styles of Roman painting are called first style, second style, third style, and fourth style. <laughs> so uh, kind of easy to remember. Um, so we're going to look at some examples of these, but first I want to talk about these, this kind of painting in general. Um, so one of the things when we're looking at Pompeii and the surrounding towns, um, we have this really nice complete record of the changing interior design and the changing stylistic preferences in the ancient world, which is kind of amazing to have, right? Um, so we also have a, a lot of prosperity in this region. So um, it's, it's quite a thing to have multiple murals in one house, and a lot of the houses in Pompeii and Herculaneum have multiple murals. So it's a very um, prosperous area, so people had uh, a lot of stability and a lot of um, extra income, extra money to spend on things like decor and art. Um, I also want to talk about the technique a little bit. So these are uh, fresco buono, or true fresco meaning that the wall has a layer of plaster and while the plaster is still wet, the painting is done so that the painting literally becomes part of the wall, part of the plaster of the wall. The other kind of fresco is fresco secco, which also means a dry fresco, which is when the plaster on the wall is completely dry, then the, the painting is added. So this is uh, kind of because it's done while the plaster is wet, it's sort of um, more integrated into the wall, right? 
Um, sometimes the plaster in these homes, if the people were particularly wealthy, would be mixed with marble dust. It was very expensive, but it gave it that kind of marble sheen, and, and that is translated then into the paintings. Um, once everything is dry and that layer of painting in uh, the plaster has dried into the plaster, they would go back and paint over it again to, to give more vibrancy uh, to the painting. But that's part also of why it's so uh, well preserved. Okay, so let's look at some examples of this and talk about it. So first style wall painting, um, for our example of this, we are looking at the Samnite house in Herculaneum. As you remember, the Samnites were the people who uh, lived in this area before it became part of the Roman Empire, before uh, Consul Sulla came down and, and kind of took it over. <coughs> so this is in the late second century. Herculaneum is very near Pompeii. It's great to visit. I recommend uh, going and, and checking out Pompeii and Herculaneum. And uh, Napoli has the wonderful um, Museum of Archaeology that has a lot of great artifacts that we talk about in this class, and it's very nearby. Go to Sorrento, beautiful. Have some limoncello. That's where it is uh, mostly produced. OK, so the first style, uh, being someone my age, I liken the first style to the 1990s. So in the 1990s, if you lived in uh, Midwestern suburbia, particularly as I did, that's where I grew up, you maybe had, uh, maybe in your kitchen or something, your probably mom, but maybe your dad or somebody got into um, faux finishes, faux being F-A-U-X. So I know in my kitchen, my mom uh, on the pantry did like kind of a, like a stoned finish on the pantry that looked like kind of a stucco-y stoned finish and then painted like some ivy going over it. Um, so that was super common, this idea of painting like different textures and finishes and things on your uh, walls, particularly in kitchens for some reason, uh, was very popular in the 1990s. So that idea was not original to the 1990s. It actually goes all the way back to the late second century, um, which is the first style painting and what it is is essentially just like faux finishes it's just painting walls to imitate marble and it's just painting on stucco creating a little bit of relief and not just to imitate one kind of marble but the most popular kind of finish this was like this where you had all different kinds of stone finishes represented the idea being if you could afford all these luxurious different kinds of stone that come from all over the place that are not local, that's very expensive and luxurious. So the next best thing to having all that imported is just to have someone paint it to look like that, okay? So this is um, basically the, the kind of preference at the time of the first style. This continues on through all the styles. We see an integration of this kind of faux finish, but it originates in the late second century in the first style painting. Uh, the Greeks did this as well. They did sort of a, a, a similar version of this. Um, the second style is a little bit trickier, so there's a lot of different things that happen that get glumped together as the, the second style. So um, the first style sticks around, but after about 80 BC, we start uh, seeing kind of new things happening, not just faux finishing. Uh, this is probably something that's, that's started by the Romans rather than ripped off from the Greeks, which a lot of their stuff is. And so we start seeing things like an imaginary 3D world that kind of dissolves the walls. So this one isn't the best example of that. We'll look at one in a minute that is that makes more sense. But basically the idea that the room keeps going outside the room and goes into these garden spaces or shows these architectural courtyards and landscapes. Um, and that it's very three-dimensional. There's uh, a lot of attention to things like perspective, things like uh, value and modeling and making things look three-dimensional and, and realistic. So it's a little bit the opposite of first style in some ways. Instead of imitating something that goes on the inside, it's imitating what's happening in the outside. Um, so well, like I said, we'll look at s several examples of this because there's a lot of ways this manifests. But one of them um, is, is things like this. So we have this dynastic uh, mystery freeze. Um, so this is in a room that was used to celebrate the rites of Dionysus. Okay, so Dionysus is, um, you'll notice I'm saying Dionysus, not Bacchus. Bacchus is his Roman name, but this specifically, these mystery cults um, worshiped Dionysus, the Greek version of the god, and this is the god of wine, right? 
And so um, this becomes a very popular religion at the time among women. So it's kind of, I equate it a little bit to in the Victorian era when uh, women started getting really interested in the occult and holding seances and things. So this was something that these wealthy women um, became interested in kind of creating this little sub-religion that was performing these rituals and things to the Greek god Dionysus. And it's, it's sort of, um, it's just this really particular interesting thing that happens at this time. Um, and, it, and it was really pretty exclusively celebrated among women, which is sort of interesting. So women would imitate Ariadne, which is Dionysus' bride, and dress like her, and dress in these kind of Greek clothings and things, and drink wine, and all right. So um, in here we have uh, several different figures. So we have Dionysus in the middle there, who has someone draped over him feeding him wine. We have um, this winged figure who is whipping someone over on the side. So uh, she's whipping a, a semi-nude woman. Um, so there's also some things that are a little bit S&M kind of to do with these rituals and things. So it's a little bit naughty, basically. Um, so you need this second style painting to make you feel like you're in the scene of this myth of what's happening. So that it makes you feel like you're breaking that uh, picture plane and, and actually interacting with these figures. This is another kind of second style painting. So um, this is kind of what we would call mature uh, second style paintings. So this is three dimensional settings that extend beyond the wall. So it's meant to look like these are windows or passageways where you could literally just walk out into this garden. This is in uh, Bosco Real. Uh, it's in the villa of Publius Fenius uh, Sinistor. This is very near Pompeii. This is another one of these cities that's near Pompeii. Um, these frescoes are no longer in that city. That's where they're from. But this is one where the whole room was cut out. All the walls and the floor and the furniture and everything was taken and moved to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So if you're at the Met, it's a gigantic museum. There's lots of different things, but there's this one wing that I think they, they call decorative arts and they have kind of these whole rooms from different periods in time. It's really cool. It's sort of problematic because you think about these things being removed from their native countries and where they belong, but it's pretty interesting to be able to see all these different art historical um, time periods represented in one place. So it's pretty rad. If you're ever in New York at the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art, make sure you go check out this room because it exists there with its furniture all intact. Um, so here we see things like linear perspective. So we have one point linear perspective. So on this detail that I've zoomed in on, you can see how all the columns recede. So um, a lot of people credit this technique to the Renaissance, and, and we don't really see it widely used again until the Renaissance, but they're wrong. Uh, the Greeks knew about this, and the Romans uh, did as well, and it's really uh, exhibited in the second style kind of painting. Uh, the Greeks first used it for stage set designs, uh, so the Greek name for it was uh, skinografia, which is um, S-K-E-N-O-G-R-A-P-H-I-A, -A, which means uh, scene painting, literally. So they would refer to perspective drawing, making things look accurate uh, with perspective as skinografia, which is really just making sets for plays, which is kind of interesting. It kind of makes sense, because when you think about the background in a play, it's meant to imitate what things look like out in the world, right? Well, painting something in linear perspective is meant to look realistically like what things look like out in the world. So it's not that far off for it to be called this. Um, linear perspective is used a lot in the second style. Many rooms did not have windows. Just structurally, windows were difficult. So this was kind of the, the next best thing. It was a way to make picture windows, basically. And you can see that even on the painted uh, wall, the structures follow some of the orders, right? So we have a nod to ionic columns here with these volutes and that kind of thing. Okay, the other thing that we see in second style painting is this interest in landscape, okay? So rather than just focusing on putting yourself in this mystery scene from mythology or uh, focusing solely on architectural perspective, um, we also see things like this, where it's literally painted to look like you're in a garden, OK? 
okay like you're in a gardenscape outside so this is uh in the villa of livia so livia was um, octavian augustus's third wife and kind of his favorite wife his, she was a, a big advisor of his and is pretty historically important so this was at her uh, villa in Prima Porta, Italy. Um, and it, it was in a barrel vaulted room, so the ceiling vaults. Um, and it's this kind of lush gardenscape that's created. So this is where we see um, a technique used maybe for the first time, and that's atmospheric perspective. So the idea, in addition to linear perspective, which if you look at the garden wall and how it has that little indentation around the tree, that follows one point linear perspective. So we still have that kind of mathematical aspect here. Um, but we also have what's called atmospheric perspective. And that's where things that are closer are sharper, are, are more in focus, and things that are in the far distance are blurrier. Colors are sharper up close, more bright, and are diminished and uh, sort of more uh, neutral the further back you go. So we see this idea of atmospheric perspective being used in tandem with linear perspective in this painting, which is very advanced um, for its time. And it, it basically, it's just kind of creating depth. It's sort of maximizing how much uh, the illusion of depth you can make. This one always reminds me a little of the uh, Akrotiri landscape, that kind of Dr. Susi looking one when we were looking at the prehistoric Aegean and we looked at that um, that room. It's called the Spring Fresco. It's on the island of Thera, which similar to this, Thera explodes, right? And so we have a lot of things that are well preserved because of that volcanic eruption. But if you remember that particular room, the spring fresco, was the first instance that we see where it's kind of art for art's sake, purely decorative art. It's not telling us a story. It's not documenting any important figures. Uh, it's not showing um, a hunt of animals. It's really just this sort of scenery. And it was all landscape, but it also had kind of fantastical non-local color, looked a little Dr. Susie. So this is a little more realistic. But it's again just decorative, just creating the scene, right? It's not documenting anything. It doesn't have any kind of narrative, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so now we're going to look at third style, um, which is kind of, I think it's just sort of funny. And I'll tell you why I think it's funny. So the things, the hallmarks of uh, third style are delicate linear work. Um, Generally, we're not imitating marble anymore at this point. We just have these sort of solid colors. Um, it's not showing the outside world in an illusionistic, realistic way, like we're actually looking through windows. And it's mostly monochromatic, so it's very toned down. And we see this in style a lot, right? Like right now at the time of this recording in 2021, um, for the past couple years, kind of everything in interior design has been gray everything's gray right now it's like gray and white and that's it basically and so my guess is things will swing back the other way and things will get really flamboyant again because that tends to be kind of the thing like trends in interior design tend to sort of swing back and forth so this is sort of the more muted uh response to second styles we get this this more chill kind of uh less elaborate third style it's very interesting to me uh so we have, um, okay, so we have uh, this, uh, these little linear works. When you look really closely at them, they're actually colonnettes. They're little tiny spindly uh, columns that still have their little volutes and everything. Um, so it's still kind of a nod to these ideas about order, but they're not realistic they're not shown like they're supporting anything real out in the world we have this sort of nod toward a pediment it's not really a pediment so it's sort of an abstracted more delicate more um decorative kind of version of the architectural portrayals that we've seen before the other thing that i think is hilarious is in the middle of these things you'll often find these little tiny and i've blown it up here um paintings that are uh, of architecture so they don't want them to be realistic they don't want it to look like a window but they kind of maybe want you to know that they can still do it so it's just like this tiny little architectural um, painting in the middle which is sort of like I said a little bit funny so that's uh, that's 
third style. So this is um, uh, Basso Tricas. This is uh, from the 10th, uh, from 10 BC. And so this, is, this also exists at the Met. You can see this at the Met in New York. Um, and this is the Villa of Agrippa Postumus. Um, so this is from the uh, cubiculum, which is the bedroom. And uh, this is pretty typical of what third style looks like. So we have that little floating architectural landscape painting in floating in the middle of this little weird spindly architectural frame. Uh, Vitruvius, who was an important um, architect and writer of the time, so he wrote the 10 books of architecture, and he hated the style. He like pans the style. He really, really hated third style, which is kind of uh, funny. Okay, moving on, let's talk about fourth style. So this starts, we start seeing uh, third style around 10 CE, we start seeing fourth style around 50 CE, and then it continues a little later till about 90 CE. So here it has a lot of similarities with um, second style. So we have architectural vistas seen through walls like in second style, but in this case, they don't really make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't really follow the logic of the kind of the picture windows because if you look at these windows, the architecture outside is crazy, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't relate to each other. So one window to the next doesn't relate to each other. And then there's also insets of things that tell these mythological stories or portraiture or something like this that also have no relationship in the background to the other um, architectural settings in these other windows. So it's kind of like, some of the ideas behind second style, but abstracting them a little bit so they don't have to actually relate to each other. It's kind of going into this fantasy direction. Um, so this is the Ixion room. This is uh, from the House of Vedi, which in the last lecture we looked at the House of Vedi in Pompeii quite a lot. And it's from the uh, Triclinium, which is the, the dining room. Um, this is a really complex composition. It's multicolor. Um, it kind of combines all the styles. We see some of that faux <clears throat> kind of marble painting from uh, first style. We see some uh, kind of, definitely some nods to second style. We see um, not as much from third style, but it's kind of an interesting uh, elaborate room. We have these architectural fragments uh, that don't relate to each other. And then we have this mythological story being told. So in this main um, pictorial frame over here, this is the story of um, uh, Ixium. So Ixium um, makes the mistake of trying to seduce Hera, right? So this is a Greek myth. So Zeus, Hera's husband, is allowed to impregnate and seduce anyone he wants. But when someone tries to seduce his wife, Hera, that is not cool with Zeus. So Zeus comes in and uh, he, um, punishes uh, Ixium by binding him to a perpetually spinning wheel. So you can see Ixium over there is attached to that wheel and Zeus is just gonna spin it and spin it forever. And Hera's looking on and she's just like, oh my God, this guy, my husband is ridiculous. So uh, that's kind of this mythological subject matter happening here. Uh, Ixium was the king of the um, Lepenths. So he's the king of this ancient uh, tribe of people. Okay, so although the paintings have Greek myths as subject matter, um, they're not necessarily direct copies of Greek work. So a lot of the sculptures that we have coming up in the Roman um, Empire are directly copied from some of the Greek work. The paintings takes the subject matter, but it's uh, done in a distinctly Roman style. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about mosaics, and then I'm going to end this particular uh, section of, of our lecture. So uh, this is a wall mosaic. A lot of the work from this time period that's done in mosaic is done on the floor. So this is a little bit atypical in that it's on the wall. Um, occasionally we see other things like this mosaics on walls or ceilings, but um, as I said, much more likely to be seen on the floor. This one is from uh, Herculaneum again, which like I've said, if you have the chance, by all means go, it's pretty fantastic. This is um, from what's called the House of Neptune and Aphitrite. The, the reason it's called that, a lot of these um, archaeological sites are named after the prominent artifact that's found there. 
So this is the most prominent thing there. So um, Amphitrite was Neptune's wife, okay? So we have them depicted together. This is actually the backing for a fountain. So it's the fountain um, kind of embedded in the peristyle of a uh, dolmus of a house. Um, so they're husband and wife, uh, and that kind of portrayal was um, really popular in private homes of married couples. They'd show like married uh, deities together in their house to kind of the idea being that that sort of solidified their marriage or their marriage was in the image of these people they worshipped or something like this. So that's fairly typical as far as a theme. Another really interesting thing that happens around this time, and this is a part of a fourth style wall, it's been removed from its original setting and is now at the Museo Nazionale uh, in, Napoli, in Naples in Italy. Um, so this is a portrait of a husband and wife. So up until this time, we've mostly just seen um, paintings of mythological subject matter or purely decorative architectural work or landscape. So, you know, gods, people from the myths, things like this. Something that becomes popular at this time is not just portraiture and sculpture, like the imagines, the wax faces of the dead that we've talked about before, but also um, painted portraiture. So this is a husband and wife, and this portrait of them was in their home. And a lot of times they would have interesting sort of um, props that they would hold to tell us something about the, the people being portrayed. Um, so this, again, kind of makes sense because we have this custom of keeping wax imagined, so it's not that surprising that portraits become a thing. Um, so this, uh, this guy, the husband, is uh, Terentius Neo, we know his name, um, and so he's holding this scroll with a wax seal, and that would have been their marriage license, their marriage certificate at the time, basically. Uh, the seal itself is the symbol of the marriage, um, and then if we look at his wife, she's holding a stylus up and like kind of resting it on her chin, and then she's holding this um, tablet in her hand, this would have been something to write on and to write with. So for women at this time, the fact that a woman in the Roman Empire is holding a stylus and a tablet means A, she's very wealthy, okay? B, she's educated, which is not true of all women, even women in the patrician class. So this woman wants it known about her that she is wealthy, you can look at her jewelry and everything, and also that she is educated. Okay, so um, oftentimes you see some kind of little clues in the portraiture that tell us things like that about, uh, about the people being depicted. This is a little bit more unusual. I think this one's kind of, I don't want to belittle the ancient um, people of Pompeii, but it's kind of cute, I guess. So this is uh, a guy named Menander. If any of you have taken uh, classical theater, um, for some reason, you might know who this is. So um, this is a portrait of a famous person. So this isn't, he didn't live in this house. He, this is not his time period. So he um, he's a Greek poet named Menander and he's known as the first to write the new comedy. So he wrote 108 comedies during his lifetime and he won this prize at the Linnea Festival eight times, which is a big deal. Um, and a lot of his work is lost to us now in contemporary times except for some fragments. The piece that we have the most of that survives is called Discolos, and uh, Discolos is a Greek word that sort of means like a, a kind of like a grouch, like a misanthrope basically, uh, and that's the most complete surviving play. Anyway, what I think is cute about this is that this is a painting of a comedic writer and performer who would have been quite famous. He's a Greek uh, writer. And so this person, when they were paying someone to do their interior design, said, I would really like a portrayal of my favorite writer. So it's kind of like putting a poster up in your room in some ways. Like when I was uh, a lot year in college and in my dorm room when I was in college, I had a Bob Dylan poster up on the wall. That's someone very old for all of you probably. Maybe today you have Justin Bieber, I don't know. But so it's kind of that kind of thing. So to me, it's sort of cute that they had this fresco painter come in and paint their favorite celebrity on their wall. So this is a portrayal of Meander. On the opposite wall, 
they had um, a portrait of Euripides, so he's another writer, but he wrote more of the tragedies, so they wanted to have a representation so that they're also deep. They don't just like the funny stuff, right? So it's, um, so it's kind of, it's, I don't know, I think it's kind of neat to see those kind of similarities across the ages. Uh, this painting blows my mind every time I look at it, and I know that it seems maybe less exciting than the other things we've talked about in this lecture. This is the last thing we're going to talk about today. So this is from a fourth style wall. It has been cut out of the wall and is now at the Museo Nazionale uh, Napoli, Naples. Um, and if we look at this, so this is a painting uh, with peaches. These are unripe peaches, and then a, um, a kind of pitcher or vase uh, with water in it. And so this is pretty exciting to me because we generally credit the advent of the still life painting to uh, the northern Renaissance painters in the Renaissance, way, way later, so like the 1500s. So, you know, literally uh, 1500 years after this painting exists is where we, we think of the invention of the still life. If any of you are taking drawing with me as well, you know what a still life is. It's where you arrange some objects and do a realistic portrayal of them. That really becomes popular with the Northern Renaissance painters, particularly the Dutch painters in the 1500s. So the fact that this exists and is super old uh, and exist, existed in a wall in uh, Herculaneum and is the first still life. Not only is it a still life with peaches and this uh, vase full of water, but look at their attempt at realism. Look at the way they've included shadows. They've included a full value scale on each of the peaches and this cast shadow work. They've included the highlights on the glass. Painting uh, glass is very annoying. Ask anyone in one of my painting glass classes. They, they're required to do it a lot. Um, so this is really kind of a magic thing for a painting nerd like me, that this exists all the way back uh, in this time period in the uh, Republican era of uh, the Roman Empire. Okay, so I'll stop talking about painting now. Um, in the next lecture, we'll get a little bit of history on uh, the development of the early empire. And then we're going to look at some of the uh, statuary and architectural work that comes in during that period. All right, thanks guys.